Ignition running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. It's 7 after the hour. I'm Eric Erickson. This is Atlanta's Evening News. Welcome. The phone number, 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. The fallout from Covington Catholic uh, continues. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, it's the kids in Washington at the Right to Life uh, March for Life that uh, a a YouTube clip or a Twitter clip actually started circulating among members of the media showing the kids assaulting a Native American drum beater, and they were attacked, savaged uh, by CNN, The Washington Post, The New York Times. Uh, the Washington Post, The New York Times, they interviewed Nathan Phillips, that is the drummer who... Uh, was a portrayed himself as a combat veteran from Vietnam who said the kids approached him and started harassing him and chanting inappropriate things at him, and he made the story up. The YouTube or the Twitter clip was selectively edited to make it look like the kids were the aggressors and they were not. And I have to tell you, I'm kind of horrified today that the left wing view of this is that well, they're still these kids are still terrible because they're wearing a Make America Great Again caps and they're from a Catholic school that's pro life, so clearly they're a bunch of Nazis. That that really is the left wing view today. You've got a, a bunch of even left wing pundits out there saying, well, yeah, we got it wrong, but we're not going to apologize because these kids are bigots anyway. Uh, more of the fraying at the seams of the United States. Here's an interesting bit from CNN, though. It turns out that the original account that circulated the clip was a troll from abroad, most likely a Russian troll. Uh, the account portrayed the owner of the account as a teacher, middle class from California, and uh, that account used someone else's picture. That person says it was not, wasn't their account. Uh, CNN began tracing the account, and it was tied to a bunch of Russian issues and others. Yes, that's right. Uh, The media that accuses conservatives of falling for lies from Russian trolls on Facebook fell for a lie on Twitter from a supposed social justice warrior that was not. Uh, Yet again, another situation where uh, foreign individuals were able to capitalize on contempt among the tribes in the United States to flare something up. And what we're seeing, despite all of this evidence now, is people on the left refusing to uh, to apologize. I mean, Kirsten Powers on CNN has lost her damn mind. over. I mean, she lost it over the Kavanaugh thing, and she's just broken. Trump has apparently left her broken. She's doubling down on this. That And, and you know, you can say that their behavior was still bad. Okay, I'll give you that. But let's, let's, let's compare facts here. Uh, the fact is you based your opinion on an edited video, and in the real video, we see this drum beater, Nathan Phillips, approaching these kids. The kids are already being yelled at by a cult called the Black Hebrew Israelites. The Black Hebrew Israelites, they're like the Westboro Baptist Church except black. Uh, and they were chanting at the kids, your president is gay, your president is a homosexual, uh, give, and then the F word, Gaysler writes, and then calling one of the black kids who was there with the Catholic school, uh, expletives and uh, racial slurs and, uh, gay slurs. So the kids are being yelled at by this, uh, cult and the drummer approaches. And if you actually watch the full video, you can tell the kids seem to think that this guy may be coming to to break things up, drowned out the the chanty. But nope, Nathan Phillips is a left-wing activist, and he has gone to college campuses in the past to harass conservatives, according to multiple reports out there. A uh, guy I talked to who's actually uh, associated with the March for Life says uh, this guy is a known activist. The Washington Post should have known better than to talk to him. But this selectively edited video shows up online. Reporters buy it. Nathan Phillips goes and talks to the Washington Post, gives them a very sympathetic story about being bullied, threatened, and whatnot by these kids, that the kids were chanting, build the wall. They weren't chanting, build the wall. They, they weren't. They were, uh, if anything, they were mimicking the drummer, and you can tell that the kids think that he's supporting, and when they realize he's not, they shut up. You don't have to believe me for this. This is the most profound thing about it. You don't have to believe me about this. You can watch the video for yourself. And there is no other way to view the video than Nathan Phillips approaches these kids as these kids are being yelled at. As Nathan Phillips gets closer to them, he starts pounding his drum even louder. 
The kids begin to chant with him, thinking they know what he's chanting. They clearly don't. They become confused. And when it becomes very clear that Nathan Phillips is there to harass the kids, they shut up. The one kid who's getting all the blame for the supposed murk, he's just standing there trying to smile at the guy and not let him get under his skin. That's all there is to it. This isn't me reading my, my impression into it. This isn't me reading into it. This is what happened. And the media fell for the dirty trick. The media fell for the lie. The media fell for the fake news. They're mad at the president for calling them the enemy of the people, but the press is increasingly the enemy of truth. They're all about the narrative. This is not the first time the media has done that. The media, more often than not, has this narrative that young white men are a privileged elite who need to be taken down a notch. We have seen this with the Duke lacrosse rape case where a young black woman who was a stripper at a nightclub accused three Duke lacrosse team members of raping her. An aggressive left-wing prosecutor who wanted to run for higher office uh, took up her cause, savaged the kids in the media. The media bought it hook, line, and sinker. Uh, The media did not believe the boys and really just ran after them ruining their lives, targeting them for character assassination. And it turned out she had made it up. They were innocent. Then you saw it with the University of Virginia case. Rolling Stone magazine, Sabrina Erdley, runs a story that's entirely fictitious about a fraternity at UGA that that, uh, gang-raped a girl. And there were actually reporters out there who attacked others for not believing the story or questioning facts about the story. There were facts in the story that did not make sense. And when people questioned them, they were they were accused of being apologists for rapists. Other reporters, not even reporters at Rolling Stone did this because, you know, they're privileged white frat boys. These are privileged white private Catholic school kids. Then there's the, the um, Brett Kavanaugh situation. Of course Brett Kavanaugh was a rapist. He went to an exclusive Georgetown prep Catholic school. Of course. Of course he was a rapist. On and on, constantly and consistently, the media run stories attacking white guys for being bad, for doing things that they did not do. It is easy to get the media to run with these stories. And have you noticed that these are all very one-sided? When there are these stories that circulate about people on the left, more often than not, the media gives them the benefit of a doubt. They wait 24 hours to try to get the facts. With stories like this, the media rushes out and gets egg on their face. The media is always very, very cautious when it's a left-wing group accused of bad behavior. And after the 24 hours, occasionally you find out it is bad behavior, but the media comes up with a good spin job to deflect it. Not so with this. They were out of the gate as soon as the video hit, attacking these kids. That school, by the way, the the Covington Catholic in Covington, Kentucky, they couldn't meet today. There were so many death threats and security issues, they had to shut school down today. Today was their first day back. What we're seeing here is left-wing Jesus. Now, I know I, I occasionally, some, some of the criticism I hear is I spend too much time talking about Jesus. Well, you know, it, it, it's worth it because there's a great contrast between real Jesus and left-wing Jesus. Uh, C.S. Lewis one time walked into, you know, C.S. Lewis Chronicles of Narnia. Um, C.S. Lewis walked into a seminar one time. It was an interfaith conversation on the differences of religion, and they were trying to find what really set the various religions apart. And the Muslim scholar, the Buddhist scholar, the, um, the the Jewish scholar, they're all in the room. They're all having the argument. And Lewis pops his head in and someone looks at him, recognizes him and says, Lewis, what separates Christianity from all the other religions on the wor- in the world? We're having a hard time figuring something out, a, a differentiator. And he said, oh, that's easy, grace. Every other religion has a concept of karma. Even Islam has a concept of karma. You're asking God not for his grace, but you're asking God for his mercy. In Christianity, you have this idea of grace. And what we see with the decline of Christianity in the United States, with the decline of religion, with the increase in people who say they're not religious, the increase in people who say they're atheists, there's really no such thing as an atheist. 
all that's happened is you've morphed religion from belief in a higher power to a belief in something else. And like other religions outside of Christianity, the concept of grace has gone away. And what we're seeing here is the mob on the left is amply disproportionately represented in the media. Uh, the media disproportionately has a group of people who believe themselves woke. I hate using that word, but you know what it means. Um, hipster social justice warriors. They buy into this stuff, and you either conform to the mob or you burn in hell. Conform to the mob or you can have your life destroyed. These kids were wearing, wearing red Make America Great Again hats. They clearly are bigots because they're wearing the hat. They clearly worship a racist president, and therefore they can be savaged and attacked as bad. We're not going to show them grace. We're not going to let the facts play out. We're just going to go on an attack and destroy because they're clearly bad by wearing the red hat. It is an article of faith among the left now that people who wear these red Make America Great Again hats are racist or at least supportive of a racist, and therefore we need not show them grace. We need not have any mercy on them. We can destroy them. It is a very religious idea uh, among the progressive activists now. They may not worship God. They worship government. And instead of drawing people to a higher power, they want to draw people to their social creed, and that means you have to conform. And if you don't conform, you're going to burn in hell. They're going to destroy you. They're going to ruin your life. And if they see signs of you not conforming, if they see that you're a heretic by supporting another viewpoint, by actually being a person of faith, by supporting the president, by wearing a Make America Great Again hat, they will make you care. You will be made to care on this issue. One way or the other, you're going to be made to care. And they tried to make these Catholic kids care because they thought these Catholic kids, they believed the Native American. They didn't believe the kids because the kids are white. They're from a private Catholic school. They're at the March for Life. They're wearing Make America Great Again hats. They cannot be believed under intersectionalism because they're the highest link of the chain. you got to go to the bottom to find truth. And so there they believe the Native American hippie, uh, anti-war, anti uh, left-wing activist who claimed to be a combat veteran in Vietnam and was not. They believed him. He, he played the media. And now it's blown up in their faces. By the way, uh, someone just found a clip of what happened after this. They're circulating it. Um, this actually is a verified clip. I'm, I'm not just rushing into this like the media rushed into the other one. You see the end of what happened? Now that we know the beginning, how did it break up? The chaperones called the kids to get on the bus and leave the scene. And what did the Native American and the protesters who were with him do? Went after the chaperones. Yes, haven't heard that in the media, have you? You can go check out my Twitter feed at E.W. Erickson. You can see that video for yourself. Uh, this is left-wing Jesus. There's no mercy. There is no grace. You conform to the mob or you can be destroyed. Keep that in mind as we head into 2020. It is 25 after the hour. Eric Erickson here. Oh, 26 after the hour now. How about them apples? Uh, how are we doing on time? We're doing great on time. I'm going to go to Destiny in Atlanta. Welcome to the program. Hi, Mr. Erickson. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm amazing. I am currently a senior at Woodward Academy in here in Atlanta, Georgia. And as a black African-American female, only 17 years old and conservative at that, I just want to say that I can feel so bad for those kids because I know personally how it feels to be the tyranny of the majority of the of the left against us right uh, against us right um, people who actually believe that the president is actually doing his job. Okay, I, I, you broke up a little bit on me. Say that last part again. Who's doing their job? The president. I truly believe that those students had a right to express their opinions. And the way the left-wing media is going, gasping so hard against this, when they didn't even know the full extent of what the video actually showed, they just jumped to conclusion is the exact reason why the left is basically tyranny of the majority. Yeah, it very much is mob rule from the left. Destiny, thanks very much for the phone call. Uh, it, it is mob rule. And, and by the way, there's a rumor out the president is going to invite the uh, Covington, Kentucky school kids to the White House. Uh, he tweeted in their defense this morning as well. There, There is something to be said for the media being willing to go after these stories and pursue them. And it is always, the pattern is always that they fall for the attacks on conservatives. And they do it frequently. It is a real lack of grace on their part and a real bias on their part. And 
there's really nothing that can be done other than turn off the channel or unsubscribe for the paper. But, you know, more and more this is going to happen, and the reason it's going to happen more and more is because, uh, a, particularly with newspapers, as they become a, a more um, sponsored entity, like the New York Times is, is now captive by its left-wing subscribers in New York City, every story's got to scratch their itches, and that includes portraying people on the right in the worst possible light. And it's going to escalate from here, like it did with the BuzzFeed story, playing into the beliefs of the left. We'll get into that when we come back. It is 38 after the hour. I am Eric Erickson taking your calls here in Atlanta. 404-872-0750-1800 WSB Talk. Glad to have you with me this evening. I was on Bill Maher's show, their season premiere on Real Time uh, on HBO Friday night. They flew me out to L.A., did the show Friday night, came back Saturday morning. Uh, of course, you leave L.A. in the morning, you wind up here in the late afternoon, got back at 4.45 in the evening. What was so interesting about it, and the reason I, I bring it up, not not to, to actually brag, there actually is a relevant point here. Uh, Bill Maher very, very insistent the president's a Russian agent and that he needs to be impeached. And Barney Frank, remember Barney Frank, a uh, former uh, liberal congressman, I believe, first gay congressman uh, from Massachusetts, very, very liberal guy, uh, was very insistent that the president should not be impeached, that it would be nonsense to impeach the president, silly to impeach him, that it would do nothing but embolden the right and ensure Trump gets reelected. They need to beat him at the ballot box. It was a very interesting juxtaposition with Marr, who very much uh, wants to impeach Trump uh, yesterday if he could. Now. I say all of that to say that the BuzzFeed story had broken um, before I had gotten out to L.A. It, it actually happened Thursday evening. I was uh, sitting in the lobby bar at the Hilton at the airport and having a beer, and the story broke uh, that BuzzFeed had, record, had reviewed records and witness testimony or others had who were familiar with it who told BuzzFeed that the president had coordinated with Michael Cohen on his lies. And, uh, well, it blew up from there. By Friday morning, every major news network except Fox News was covering the story as if it was gospel truth. Fox News was under attack for not covering the story as gospel truth. And it blew up in their faces by the afternoon. So here, here's what happens. When you, when you go on with Bill Maher, um, a week beforehand, they email you tentative topics. The day before, so on Thursday, before you go to L.A., a producer calls and you spend an hour on the phone doing show prep. Of here's what we're here are our topics that we're thinking of doing. There are usually ten. You spend an hour giving your thoughts on the topics, and the producer pushes back, and you engage in a uh, conversation and try to vet you on your points, make sure your points are clear in your head. And then on Friday, the executive producer calls when you get out to L.A., wonderful guy named Scott, and Scott says, here are the five of those ten, here are the five we've settled on. Well, on Friday, it's I've done the show now, this is third or fourth time, called back, which is very unusual, and said, you know what, we're, we're going to talk about this BuzzFeed story. Well, then the Mueller investigators released a statement saying the story was, was inaccurate. The characterization of the documents and testimony was inaccurate. It is exceedingly rare for the Mueller investigators to release any sort of statement at all. And they released one. The only other time I can think of that the Mueller team released a statement was also a story about Michael Cohen. And it is the McClatchy story that Michael Cohen went to Prague to meet with the Russians, kind of a, a confirmation of coordination with the Russians. And the Mueller team, I believe that story, don't hold me to that, but I think that's the story the Mueller team pushed back. There are only two that the Mueller team has ever publicly pushed back on. And, you know, with that story, even Michael Cohen has now pled guilty and admitted all sorts of things he previously denied, but he's still consistent in denying that. And McClatchy has now run a second story claiming it's true, even though Cohen is pushing back, uh, even though he's pled guilty now, saying, nope, wasn't me. Well, with the BuzzFeed story, it's just one of those things. It's like the Covington, Kentucky Catholic school video. It's just too good to check for the left because it scratches all the itches and it confirms all the biases. 
They know the president lied, and they know the president coordinated his lie with Michael Cohen. Pay no attention to the fact that the BuzzFeed story, the the first named reporter is a guy named Jason Leopold who has a history of uh, sources not delivering, shall we say. The Columbia Journalism Review called him a fabulist, accused him of coming from the Stephen Glass School of Journalism. Stephen Glass, famously a journalist who actually made up some of his more famous stories that just weren't true. Jason Leopold is the guy who said that Karl Rove was going to be indicted uh, during the Bush administration, that sources told him this. And he's, oh, well, the sources told me that. The sources were wrong. Maybe I was getting played. Also, apparently, he used to have a drug habit. Um, now he's got this story that sources say, based on a review of documents and testimony, Michael Cohen told the Mueller investigators the president coordinated his lying before Congress. There's a problem in that the Mueller team says this is inaccurate. And in fact, Ben Smith, the BuzzFeed, doubled down on the story and said, uh, by God, the story's true. We know the sources. The sources are credible. This is what they're telling us. One reporter of BuzzFeed says they've seen the documents. Another says they haven't seen the documents. But by God, they know it's true. And the Mueller team then leaked uh, subsequently to the Washington Post and said, no, no, we want to clarify. This is actually the whole story is not true. Because BuzzFeed would say, well, what part of it is inaccurate? They should tell us. They did. They said the whole thing is inaccurate. So I wonder if the Southern District of New York is the source for BuzzFeed, and I wonder if the Department of Justice should investigate. Now, I say this with some level of knowledge here. One of the things BuzzFeed said in its report is that Trump Organization employees said the president orchestrated the lies. There's a problem. The Mueller team has not interviewed any Trump Organization employees. This has been now confirmed by multiple media outlets as one of the flaws in the BuzzFeed report. The Mueller investigators have not interviewed any of the Trump Organization employees. You know who has? The Southern District of New York. A notoriously leaky Uh, District, by the way. So let's say the Southern District of New York is prosecuting some people who worked for Donald Trump, and they are. And one of the things that they want to build their case around is the idea that the president collaborated in the lies. Well, because President Trump is not on trial in the Southern District of New York, the Southern District can make the statement... And they don't have to hold it to the same level of proof as they would if they were going after the president. They don't have to go for uh, beyond a reasonable doubt in this. They can build their case upon the president told him to lie and ha- can have witnesses come up and say that. And the president is not on trial. It's not going to get questioned as much. They can build a case around the idea that the president caused people, ordered people, uh, worked with people to lie. And treat it as a fact, even if it isn't. Because, again, the president's not on trial there. They can make the statement. And so I wonder if the Southern District is where BuzzFeed got this and why, even though the Mueller team has come out and said this isn't true, they're doubling down on it. Because they've heard it from multiple people inside the Southern District of New York that has interviewed Trump Organization employees while Mueller hasn't. Well, that should still give them a black eye when the Mueller team comes out and says, no, 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 the story's inaccurate. Michael Cohen is probably going to go to Congress. I will find out, but I will be really surprised if Michael Cohen says the president coordinated the lies with him. In fact, in his statements that we see from the Mueller investigators, what Cohen actually says is that he conformed his testimony to Congress based on the president's public statements. In other words, he didn't have to talk to the president to know what lies to tell. He just listened to what the president was saying in public, and he lied accordingly. That's what he testified. That's under oath from Cohen. There's nothing under oath from Cohen that he and the president sat in a room and coordinated his statements to Congress. Now, I suspect there is uh, some some there are a few statements in the Mueller documents that were filed regarding Michael Cohen's sentencing where it does appear he worked with people at the White House to coordinate his testimony. But not client one. That would be the president under the filings. Someone unnamed person. And I bet BuzzFeed put all of this together and concluded up the president coordinated the lies. Again, the Mueller investigators say this isn't true. And BuzzFeed has doubled down and said they're not retracting it. They 
their sources are credible. This is what they think. Uh, the most credible person in the room should be Bob Mueller, and he says it's inaccurate, so we should go with that. But the media is giving BuzzFeed a complete pass, and one of the reasons they're giving BuzzFeed a complete pass and they're pursuing the story and keeping the story alive is because you may not know this, but on Saturday, President Trump made a very reasonable offer to the Democrats to reopen the government. And the Democrats said no. no the Democrats not only said no, they said hell no. And the media really doesn't want to have to talk about the Democrats being unreasonable. So they'd rather talk about the Catholic kids from Kentucky and BuzzFeed, even though they got both stories wrong, because they would much rather ruin their credibility on fake news than have to point out their friends in the Democratic Party are suddenly the ones being unreasonable about keeping the government closed. Um, uh, Brett Bear, if you, you will, keep him in your thoughts and prayers. He and his family, uh, they were in a terrible car wreck in Montana. Uh, they were coming home from uh, a ski vacation. We're headed to the airport, and we're in a terrible wreck. And snowy, icy roads. Uh, they were found by someone, and were they were gotten to the hospital. They are still, to my knowledge, in the hospital uh, recovering. Uh, they are all okay, but uh, really banged up. So keep them in your prayers. Um, Black Panther, Charlie and I are trading text messages on this. Black Panther is a Best Picture nominee at the Oscars this year. And I hope it wins because of all the Best Picture nominees, it's the only one I saw and enjoyed. Uh, and is it really worth Best Picture? You, you see, they wanted the popular movie category because the Academy Awards people didn't think it really was a Best Picture nominee, and then they were screamed at as being racist, so they dropped that idea, and they put it in, and it's not going to win. Not because they're racist, although people are going to say it's because they're racist. It's because there are movies that are more artsy-fartsy, and I'm just not into the artsy-fartsy movies. I I'm yeah, I got to go back a long time to find a Best Picture winner at the Oscars that I even cared about. They're just, I mean, I liked Black Panther. I like the Marvel movies. I did not like Star Wars. Uh, and I, Roma, I, I've got a friend of mine who thinks it's a great movie. You can catch it on Netflix. Uh, it's just not my sort of thing. Nor are the other movies. And, you know, the only reason Vice is in there is because they all hate Dick Cheney, and it's an anti-Dick Cheney movie. Although, from what I hear, Dick Cheney comes off as the hero of the movie. The Oscars have gotten so predictable, and now they're not going to have a host because Kevin Hart, 10 years ago, dared to say something that people laughed at, uh, that now people think is not funny. So he can't be the host. So they're going hostless, which may be an improvement of the whole thing. It's just garbage. It really is. When we come back, we got to move into domestic stuff here in Georgia. We'll get back to Washington and the shutdown of the president's offer. But before we get there, Brian Kemp attended the Martin Luther King Jr. Day uh, memorial celebrations yesterday, and the Democrats turned it into a partisan affair. Meanwhile, Stacey Abrams' campaign team says they are going to do nothing but attack Brian Kemp as she decides where she wants to run, when she wants to run, if she wants to run. She's running. We'll get into it when we come back. Nine after the hour, the second hour of Atlanta's Evening News. I'm Eric Erickson. Welcome. The phone number is 404 750 wsb talk Greg Bluestein of the AJC attended the MLK services yesterday, and it, he noted, and you, you didn't have to be Greg Bluestein to notice this, that there's a pretty significant attack, 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 attack on Brian Kemp uh, from Democrats uh, participating. This is, uh, let me read you what Bluestein wrote to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. The annual Martin Luther King Jr. ceremony at the Georgia State House began Friday with a symbolic moment between Governor Brian Kemp and the slain civil rights leader's daughter. It ended with a string of speakers lobbed not-so-subtle criticism his way. None directly mentioned the Republican governor, who was sitting in a first-row seat beside the podium for much of the two-hour event and applauded each speech. 
But the target was clear after a polarizing election between Kemp and Stacey Abrams that deepened the political divide. Bernice King, the executive, chief executive of the King Center, criticized conservative policies. She had said prolonged economic injustice. State Representative Karen Bennett blasted the, quote, outrageous and egregious voter suppression right here in Georgia. Brian Tolleson, the chief executive of the Center for Civil and Human Rights, thanked Nathan Deal for standing on the right side of history by vetoing the RIFRA bill in 2016. And then, of course, there's Shirley Franklin, who always likes to stir the pot. And she says, basically, we need uh, the minimum wage in Georgia increased. Uh, and she wanted to attack Brian Kemp for uh, rounding up uh, criminal illegal aliens and supporting religious liberty and supporting restrictions on abortion. She said, quote, uh, we still debate whether immigrants are welcome in Georgia should be rounded up by vigilantes and whether religious freedom means you can legally discriminate or whether men should have control of their bodies, but women shouldn't. I find it all insulting. And kudos to Brian Kemp for sitting there and applauding each speech as each of these people is attacking him, even though they're not using his name. This is what it has come to. The politicization of everything. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday should be a holiday where we have some level of self-reflection and not just partisan gamesmanship, but that is what we had. You know, on, yesterday on the actual day, a number of reporters were tweeting out that President Trump was participating in no observances of the holiday until he showed up at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial in Washington, D.C., and then suddenly they had to delete all of those and retract them all, but they still were upset that he didn't do any more formal service. Why should he? He had Bernie Sanders in South Carolina saying he, he's sorry our president's a racist. Anyone who wears the, the red Make America Great Again hat is a racist or supporting a racist. Why should he participate? You know, as much as people say the president divides the country, and I think he does, the left does as well. Showing no grace to anyone who supports the president. If you support him, you are supporting a racist, according to the left. And I don't actually think you are. But the left is convinced it is an article of their faith that you are. And I see no reason for Republicans to humor it uh, because the only way the left has decided that you can make good and redeem yourself is to come their way on everything. It's not that you can be a conservative because if the president's a conservative, therefore conservatives are all racist according to the left. The only way that you can redeem yourself is to embrace all of their issues, support increases in the minimum wage, support abortion rights, support transgenderism, all these things. According to the left, you got to do that. Otherwise, you're still a racist bigot. So why bother even engage them? We used to be able to engage each other with differences in this country. This is me. I, I was on real time on HBO Friday night. It was one conservative against all these liberals. And we could still interact and engage and have a conversation and enjoy each other's company. But you, by and large, you can't do that anymore anywhere. You're not allowed to. Uh, it's sinful for the left to engage with people on the right these days. It's an article of faith in their secular religion, and it's sad. So uh, related to this, Stacey Abrams is running around the state attacking Brian Kemp. And her campaign says, this is a quote from her campaign, her former campaign manager, quote, we're going to give Brian Kemp living hell. In other words, the campaign attacks will not stop on Brian Kemp. Abrams criticized Brian Kemp for, this is Greg Bluestein again, she criticized Brian Kemp for refusing to expand Medicaid in Georgia, attacked him for not pushing criminal justice reform, attacked him or challenged the crowd to demand he follow through on his pivot to conciliatory language and centrist policies. Wait a second, he is! See, this is the deal, though. This this is the trick the Democrats are playing. This is what Stacey Abrams is playing. Brian Kipp wants to expand teacher pay. He wants to expand insurance coverage for the poor in Georgia. And he wants to finish Nathan Deal's criminal justice reforms. But because he doesn't want to expand Medicaid, because he also wants to get tougher on bad crimes, 
And because he wants to do other things Stacey Abrams doesn't like, he's being attacked for not being a centrist, for not being conciliatory. And it has nothing to do with his policies and everything to do with the fact that he's not doing what she wants. And in the language the left and the media together are using these days, if Brian Kemp's not willing to cave and do what the left wants, he's not being conciliatory. I mean, consider the attacks from Democrats in Georgia on Kemp's health care reform plan. Brian Kemp, in his State of the State, outlined a proposal to allow Georgia a waiver from Obamacare. And with that waiver, one of the things Georgia would do would be allow associations to pool health care funds together that has been shown repeatedly to lower costs for people by growing pools of insurable people. When you grow a pool of insurable people, it lowers the overall insurance cost per person. That works. you got to get a waiver under Obamacare to do it. Kim wants to do that. The other thing Kim wants to do is he wants to apply for some federal monies that if you get an exemption from Obamacare, you can apply for to help poor people cover their costs of health insurance. In other words, doing these two things, Brian Kemp will both lower costs and expand access to health care for people who otherwise can't afford it. And so what are the Democrats doing? They're attacking Brian Kemp. Now, why? You would think they would like these things. You would think they would like it that Brian Kemp is pr- making real proposals to lower health care costs and real proposals to expand uh, subsidization for poor people who can't otherwise afford health insurance. You would think they would like it, except they hate it because he's doing it by not expanding Medicaid. He's doing it in the way they don't want him to do it. Therefore, he's bad, according to the Democrats. They're getting what they want, just not the way they want it. And so he's bad and must be condemned. This is what we're going to see from here on out with the Democrats. It is going to be a never-ending campaign on the left to keep people angry and keep people hating Brian Kemp. What's so interesting here is that Stacey Abrams is demanding that Brian Kemp be conciliatory, and yet her campaign manager is telling people they're going to give him living hell. They want to continue to attack. They don't want to find common ground with him. They don't want to make common ground with him. They don't want to break bread with him. They just want to attack him and make people hate him. Even if he's conciliatory, they will never give him the credit. And at some point, you know, you got to look at this and, and think Brian Kemp's going to look at it all and say, why should I bother? I'm not sure that I know why he should. It is 24 after the hour. We got other stuff to get to. Um, the president says the State of the Union is going to happen. Nancy Pelosi says she's not so sure. The address uh, for the president, it's scheduled to be Tuesday night in Washington. Nancy Pelosi has suggested she may cancel it because of the government shutdown, although she has not been definitive in that. What I think is kind of interesting is that everyone treated the president so badly for canceling the CODEL of Nancy Pelosi and everyone else going to Afghanistan and, and to Brussels how would they react if she canceled the State of the Union? I bet they would say good for her, it's payback. They would not complain about her uh, disrupting norms and everything. They they would say it was good for her that she deserved it, which is just pitiful. But I suspect they will. And the president says he's given the State of the Union on Tuesday. If Nancy Pelosi will not accept him in the House of Representatives, the president says he will give it somewhere else. He will turn it into a campaign event. He will do it before a live studio audience. I think that's going to be hilarious to watch and see. Meanwhile, centrist Democrats are urging Nancy Pelosi to compromise. That's right. They want Nancy Pelosi to agree to open up the government. It it is striking to me that on Saturday evening, the president made a reasonable compromise. He abandoned the idea of a coast-to-coast wall. He gave up the idea of the Mexicans paying for it. And he decided he would let the DACA kids stay, give them three years for this whole thing to be sorted out. The Supreme Court says they're um, going to take up the case next year. So he'll give them three years to get it sorted out. And it's very reasonable. The Democrats say, well, the president was going to sign a bill to keep the government open without any of this stuff, so this isn't being reasonable. He should go back to it. Well, you know, he changed his mind. He's allowed to change his mind. And now he's walked away from the position he had staked out. He's moved towards the Democrats. 
And yet Nancy Pelosi says no. She says that the only acceptable solution is no wall. She doesn't want to compromise. She wants the president to cave. She wants the president to cave because she knows it'll hurt him politically. People are on the unemployment line who should be working solely because Nancy Pelosi wants to hurt the president. That's what it comes down to now. The president has been willing to give up on the idea of Mexico paying for it. He's been willing to give up on the idea of a coast-to-coast wall. He only wants the wall now in urban areas where the Border Patrol, even under Barack Obama, was saying it needed to be expanded and improved. That's what he wants. And he wants to allow the DACA kids to stay. He wants to remove any threat of deportation. So Nancy Pelosi is now the one telling the DACA kids, nope, uh, you got to risk deportation because we got to hurt the president politically. That's Nancy Pelosi for you. And centrist Democrats are now starting to tell her, you know what, maybe it's time to cut a deal. Mitch McConnell says he's going to put this to a vote on the floor of the Senate, and we will see where that goes. And I suspect it will go nowhere because the Democrats in the Senate are going to stand with Nancy Pelosi. But again, it is a relevant fact-based point to note. The president compromised. Nancy Pelosi won't. The phone number here, 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. It is 39 after the hour, and I am Eric Erickson. This is Atlanta's Evening News. Y'all, prior to coming into the studio, I had to work on a bird feeder. So the fourth grader has to build a bird feeder. I did not know until last night. And it cannot be from a kit. It has to be his own design. And he designed a Burger King for birds and wanted his dad to help him, um, he, yeah, I didn't cut my finger off, but God help us. Um, so we're doing dad's design. It would win no competition for beauty. Uh, Uncle Charlie is nowhere to be found to help us with his woodworking skills. So it's all me and I don't have all the fancy equipment. So nonetheless, I did not use this as an opportunity to buy power tools. We're just using a handsaw, hammer, drill, having fun except we're not. The whole fun thing, not happening. Nonetheless, we'll get it done. Now, to the phones. We need to go. Uh, Start with Jim and coming. Welcome. Hey, Eric. How are you? Can you hear me? I'm good. Good, thanks. Hey, uh, thanks for having me on the show. Really enjoy it. I think I'm I'm probably what you'd call the the democratic centrist, as you say. Um, And I do find that President Trump tends to back himself into corners sometimes. I don't think that Mexico is ever going to pay for the wall, so I, I don't see it as a concession. But if he if he doesn't say that and he finds a way to get Mexico to pay for the wall, I think that's one of the many things he does sometimes in the way he, he leads. He barks out something, says it's going to happen, puts them and himself in a corner. And, and I agree with you, too, that Pelosi needs to come to the table now and negotiate. But I wish the president would quit making these giant blank statements of this is what's going to happen. This is what we're going to do. And now he's pinned if it doesn't happen. And now we're all pinned because of it. I don't know if that makes sense or if I'm making a good point. No, but- it, look, it does. Um, it, the president could have had the, the exact deal that the president outlined on Saturday. He could have had last February. It's almost identical to that deal that he had last February that he told the Democrats he would take. And then at the last minute said, nope, not going to take it and nearly caused a government shutdown then. Um, That's one reason the Democrats are, particularly in the House, are hesitant to deal with him now is because of that deal. The president does make these big, bold statements like Mexico is going to pay for the wall and whatnot and then has to try to come up with a uh, way to justify the statement without beclowning himself. And more often than not, it's by letting other people go out and defend the statement and be beclowned like the, the whole trade war statement that, oh, because of the renegotiation of the deal of the NAFTA deal to the new deal, this is how Mexico is going to pay for it, which is just a bunch of horse poop. But. That's what the president's gone with to try to justify his ridiculous statement to begin with that he should have known better. He was never going to get Mexico to pay for the wall, and now it's going to be American taxpayers paying for the wall. 404 872 wsb talk Back to the phones we go. John in Jonesboro, you're next. Welcome. Hello, Eric. How are you? Uh, great. Um, I was going to ask, do you think the president should stick by his guns? And, and I changed that to... 
a uh, longer answer. Why do you think the president should stick with his guns on the on the wall insofar as he's willing to compromise? I think that he needs to stick to it at this point because it is his signature campaign issue. And if the president gives it up, he's handing Nancy Pelosi a huge win in the run up to 2020, which is what she wants. Uh, If the president is able to get any part of the wall built, then he wins the argument. Uh, This has become a political contest in a game of politics. This is the highest stakes we've had in a while. The president fundamentally wants a wall. He has given up on the idea of a coast-to-coast wall, recognizing that there are parts of it where there's a thing called the Grand Canyon, so you don't necessarily need the wall, and other parts, uh, that and mountains and canyons and river and whatnot, you don't necessarily need a wall. Uh, but then there are parts in city areas where you do need a wall. If the president caves, it hurts him with his base, and that's what Nancy Pelosi wants. So he's got to stand strong on this. He has to. Uh, Chuck in Noonan, you're next. Welcome. Uh, Chuck, you there? Yes, I am. Hi there. I guess my question is, how much foreign aid are we supplying to Mexico? And why can't we just reduce that foreign aid by the amount we need to build the wall to finance? Well, we only give $320 million a year to Mexico. The president wants $5.7 billion. Uh, you need a, a billion minimum to get what the president wants. Or what, what uh, the Border Patrol has requested is $1.3 million or $1.3 billion. The president wants $5.7 billion. We only give Mexico $320 million a year. So there's really not a there there. Now, you can say let's cancel it. Uh, but the $320 million a year that we go to give to Mexico mostly goes to military fund funding of military in Mexico, particularly against drug traffickers and the cartels. So if we weren't giving Mexico the $320 million to help them fight the drug cartels, that's $320 more million we would have to spend to fight the cartels. And Mexico can do it more efficiently in Mexico than us having to send troops there. So it makes sense that we would want to keep giving Mexico that money uh, and let them do it. So and even if we stopped it, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what the president wants. And you know and I know we should not actually have to have $5.7 billion should be able to build like three walls between the Pacific and the Atlantic, but that's just not the case. Why? Because government. You know, I could really do an entire two-hour show on just media screw-ups because it seems like that's all we're talking about these days. BuzzFeed, the uh, Covington, Kentucky Catholic School, really is just, it's pathetic how the media wants to lecture us on conservatives uh, circulating Russian troll memes on Facebook, and yet this is exactly what the media has done with this Covington Catholic School story. There's a little bit more to it, though. If you look at the reaction from progressives, if you look at the reaction from the media, it really is a religious reaction to it, that there are sinners, and those sinners need to either repent or they need to be cast out. That's what the media is doing. You know, the Supreme Court today upheld the president's uh, ban on transgendered people in the military. They said that the the court case can go forward, and while it goes forward, the president can keep these people from being in the military. And yet a CNN reporter called this extreme, an extremist decision by the Supreme Court to uphold a decision by democratically elected president of the United States. The left is teetering out of control here. I, I really more and more think we're headed towards some level of violence in this country, and I think the Russians know it, which is why they're playing everybody off each other. I really do think that. Uh, What we are seeing in this country is that secularists, people who describe themselves as atheists or agnostic, have a religion. That religion is premised on worshipful government. And you are a sinner unless you abandon your God and embrace the God of government. We see this in Texas, of all places. Democrats in the state legislature in Texas are introducing legislation that any person who believes in a biblical worldview can be sued by employees. If you are an employer under these proposed laws, now they're not going to get passed, there are Democrats passing them, but it shows you where the left as a whole is going. 
In Texas, one of the pieces of legislation is if you keep a Bible on premises, you can be accused of intimidating employees. If you believe in a biblical worldview, you can be accused of harassing employees. Bakers would have to bake the cakes in Texas by the left. Uh, we're seeing a left-wing progressivism, uh, a left-wing populism is really taking an anti-religious bent. Kamala Harris declared her candidacy for the presidency today. Kamala Harris, when she was the um, the attorney general for California, weaponized the California Attorney General's office and regularly targeted people of faith for harassment. Uh, she is the one who advocated for legislation rejected by the Supreme Court that would have required pro-life organizations to instruct people on how to get abortions. Kamala Harris was also very law and order. She had to keep up her law and order streak of throwing young black men in jail, but she also went after any pro-life organization. She went after religious organizations. We're going to see this more and more from the left. We're going to see more and more open hostility from the left towards people of faith. And I, I dare say, that it does require people of faith more and more to actually show some humility here. The championing the president and saying, well, yeah, he's bad, but they're worse. You do have to recognize that your faith does compel you to be a Christian seven days a week and not just on Sunday. And I do think that Christians are being done a real disservice by faith leaders who say, oh, yeah, we know the president's a womanizer who slept around with porn stars while his wife is pregnant, but hey, he's not as bad as the other side. That may be an argument you can make, but I don't think it's an argument religious leaders should make. And I think that more and more the left is going to feed off this perceived uh, culturally religious hypocrisy. And we on the right are going to have to deal with this. The left is out to get us. This case, the Covington Catholic School case, demonstrates that they will, using the media, try to destroy anyone they perceive as bad. And if you wear a red hat, they perceive you as bad. It almost makes me want to get a MAGA hat and wear it. <laughs> 